Welcome to this episode of Against the Mountains of Madness. I'm your host, Jason, and joining me again is my other host, John C. Wright. Today we're going to be having a chat about Star Wars and Star Trek. What went wrong? So, John. Yes, sir. I gather you, you've enjoyed Star Trek and Star Wars over the years? Yes, so I am a fan. I'm more than a fan. I am a, a, a confirmed devotee because my entire youthful philosophy was generated around the Star Trek character, Mr. Spock, who I wanted to be in my youth and still would like to be now that I'm an adult. I would like to be a stoical, logical, unemotional, and competent uh, officer. That's, my, that's, my, yeah, that, that's how much effect it's had on me. I can't think of any other show or stories aside from Star Trek and Star Wars that it's had as much, except for maybe Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And that's a maybe. Okay. So yes, well, big fan. Until so... recently. <laughs> So, which which of the series have you watched to what point? Um, so we know where you're coming from, in your opinions. Okay. I think I've watched more than you of some of them, so... Of the old stuff, I've watched every single episode of the original series of Star Trek, and the movies, and showed them to my kids uh, more than once, over and over again. I have you know certain pieces of dialogue memorized, and so on and so forth. Uh, Star Trek The Next Gen, I think I saw the first season... Uh, but didn't care for it, and then liked the second and remaining seasons uh, after uh, number two grows a beard. After uh, you know, uh, uh, they (laughs) get rid of they get rid of Tasha Yar and they make uh, uh, Worf the head of security. Then the shows get good. Uh, And I hate to say it, it's also after the original Roddenberry. It's also after Roddenberry uh, uh, passes away. The shows got a lot better. the other series I've watched, uh, I, I'm a particular fan of Deep Space Nine. I thought it was excellent. I thought yep. they were... I thought they had seen what uh, Babylon 5 could be, and they wanted to do something along the same lines. Now, I myself mm-hmm. am not am not a... Uh, uh, I'm not a purist. I don't, I don't consider it to be there's anything wrong with one artist trying to copy the effect that another artist has done. I, I kind of like that. It's, it's mm-hmm. how you please your audience. Uh, I saw Voyager up until a certain point, but uh, Gilligan's Island in Space uh, lost appeal to me after the... uh, There's a character's name I can't remember. She only was was fated to live for three years. Uh, After she was gone, uh, I didn't care for the show as much. I loved the the Emergency Doctor. The Emergency Doctor was the best best character on on Voyager. Uh, I saw a little bit of Enterprise... Uh, 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 and just for personal reasons, I didn't have time in my life at that time to, to watch the show. It didn't, it didn't really catch my attention. And I thought, and I'll go into reasons why later, I thought they had potential they did not use. Star Trek Diversity, I never even tried to watch because, yep. for one thing, they didn't have... Uh, oh, now I can't think of her name. They did not have the, the, uh, the young lady who played... She was in a James Bond movie... She's a martial artist. She was in Hidden Dragon, Crouching Tiger. I'm embarrassed. I can't think of her name. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yo, Michael Yo. They didn't have Michael Yo in anything but the pilot. And I would have watched the show if she had been in it. Uh, but instead they had Spock's sister as a minority, as a diversity hire girl. Yep. Who was more Vulcan than the Vulcans were supposed to be or something, something. And Something the Klingons like were just like Trump supporters. And I said, okay, I'm not even going to try this shit. <laughs> I also just heard so much that was bad about Star Trek Picard, I never gave it a try. Uh, yep. I never watched the cartoon Below Decks. I, I didn't, didn't even try it. I wasn't sure what it was about. Uh, but I did like the only real sequel to Star Trek, which is, of <laughs> course, the Orville. Yep. So, that's what I've su- su- seen and done. And how about Star Wars? Star Wars, I have watched the original trilogy many times. Yep. Uh, I'm trying to find a copy where they don't clip in the new Emperor in the second movie because the dialogue between the Emperor and uh, Vader is better when, as it was originally released. Okay. Uh, I do not like the additions and the, and the tweaks done by uh, yep. Lucas later on. So I'm in original. Han shot first. Uh, yeah, Han, Han clearly <laughs> shot first. It establishes his character. In fact, it so does. much so that I put a scene in my current space opera that I am writing where I have my character not only shoot first, but, uh, well, never mind. Uh, I make a point of it. I make, I make a sly reference to it in, in my current book. Uh, mm-hmm. Of the 
uh, of the prequilogy. Uh, I saw those once. I, I saw one of them in the theater once or twice. I thought they were good but not great, and I thought they had major uh, flaws in them. So I'd give them like a five or six on a scale of one to ten. Yep. The Disney uh, uh, sequels, I just thought, started with great promise and turned into an utter abomination. And I was That's fair. personally insulted by The Last Jedi. I thought it was actually intended to mock everything that Star Wars stood for and to mock <laughs> me as a member of the audience for liking those things. And I was, yep. and I was insulted. I was, I was personally uh, uh, stirred to fanboy wrath, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and, and instead of going out and rioting, I typed on my keyboard and said mean things so, yep. uh, to, to no audience. Uh, so that's what fanboys do when we get angry. Uh, I did not even try. I didn't. Even, I did not even try to watch uh, Rise of Palpatine or whatever that remaining stupid movie was, even though I really like Emperor Palpatine as a character and, and should watch it at some point just to see him chew the scenery. Uh, I did see some of the TV shows, but not all of them. For example, there was a, there's a five minute short made by uh, Glenn D. Tatowski. I can't I can't pronounce his name correctly. He's also the guy who did Samurai Jack, and he did Powerpuff Girls. And he did a series of Star Wars animated that were supposed to be in between the second and third prequel movie. And he did a yep. bang-up job. He did a great job. He made the Stormtroopers look really impressive, which I'm not sure you're supposed to do for someone called Stormtroopers. Uh, <laughs> and he made General Grievous actually seem like a scary villain, which he did not seem in the film. So to, for my money... Uh, Tartowski did a better job than Lucas at portraying Star Wars. Shocking as that sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a little bit of Star Wars Rebels, which I liked, because it was basically Aladdin the street rat in space, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the first season ends with a, uh, a, a Vader coming on to replace the, the Grand Inquisitor as the, as the bad guy. So it was kind of nice. Uh, I did not see Clone Wars, just for time's sake. I, it was because I, I was busy at that, at, at that time in my life and haven't gotten around to it. And uh, mm -hmm. other Star Wars products have been have either just been really inferior or really annoying, with one shining exception, which is the Mandalorian, which yep. I thought was wonderful. And I'll and as we get into it later, I can I can tell you what I can tell you what I liked sure. about it. Okay. So that's it. That's what I've seen. Okay. I should briefly cover what I've seen. I suppose. Um, sure. I think I've seen all of the original series. Um, Star Wars or Star Trek? Are we talking about? Oh, sorry, Star Trek, the original series. It's a little before my time. Um, I was, what, about 13 or something when um, TNG, the first episode, aired. So I was super excited for that. And um, so TNG is sort of the Star Trek I grew up on, as well as um, the original series movies. So mm -hmm. I saw those. Um and I, I've, I've watched the original. I've watched um, the Next Generation all the way through a couple of times. I've seen all the movies. Um, I've watched Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine is my favourite. I doubt I'm alone there. I've seen um, Voyager, and I, I enjoyed Voyager. I've watched all of those. Watched those all the way through. Uh, I've watched the first season of Discovery, and I got maybe three episodes into the second season before I just sort of gave up and haven't sort of had the energy to go back and try again. Um, I got two or three episodes into Picard and that was about as far as I got. And I just sort of, I've been following Picard via some of the commentary from the Critical Drinker and Dave Cullen and other people. Um, yeah. I watched, I actually watched Lower Decks, um, the animated show, uh, which started pretty shakily, but actually I think it's gotten reasonably good now um finding it quite watchable in the later seasons it's a it's a very comedy take on star trek but it actually i think it works pretty well um once once they sort of got past the first season um it's funny you mentioned that because uh it's funny you mentioned that because the critical drinker who you just mentioned uh spanned lower decks and the reason why and to be quite frank the reason why i didn't try to go watch it is because of his criticism of it. And he's the first usually, season he's usually is pretty one. good for in his I usually agree with him most of the time. The the first season is about yeah. seventy percent nails down a chalkboard with the really annoy with the really annoying um, main character being this omnicompetent female 
um, who's just good at everything and amazing and, and just really kind of irritating. Um, but actually, it got better later on. Um, one thing I've noticed with most Star Trek series, the first season's usually not very good. Yeah. So um, I usually try to give a Star Trek series a season and it can, I'm, I'm pretty tolerant of the first season being hit and miss because historically they usually are. <laughs> that's, that's true way back even for the original series. Sort of the original yep. series, the first few episodes were a little, were a little shaky. Yeah. But but most of the but the, the the three next generation series and oh and I watched Enterprise too, I think the first seasons of all of those the first episodes are usually pretty good like the the series sort of pilot episode is usually mm. pretty good, then the first seasons a bit hit and miss as they sort of get the characters worked out and figure it out and then it tends to pick up yeah. so I found Lower Decks did that, um, for the sake of completeness for this episode I gave Star Trek Prodigy a go which is uh, a Nickelodeon series. I don't know, the first episode was all right. I might actually keep watching. It's kind of a kid's show, so I, I, think, it'll, I think I'll lose interest pretty quickly, but um, eh, it wasn't terrible. Um, and for Star Wars, I've watched the original series, watched those as a kid. I went and saw the prequels in the cinemas, all three of them, um, went to sort of the opening night at midnight. Um, I, I, I didn't mind the prequel movies. I get why people don't like them. Um, they, they are definitely inferior to the original three, but they're yeah. pretty watchable. I, I think they're actually, they're not bad stories. Um, you know, the criticism's are legitimate. Jar Jar's annoying, but, you know. Um, but, but, the kids, yeah, I, but the kids like him. But the children like yeah, him. Yeah, well, um, I, I agree with you completely on the three sequel movies. Um, yeah. The first one was kind of a clone of... Um, a new and, hope. It but, meant to be. It was meant to be a clone to show that they could do the, the that they could capture the mood and so on. It was a little unoriginal, true. but but you know. But again, I agree. It had potential. It had potential. Um, yes. Um, uh, the last Jedi could best be described as drawing a penis on the screen. Um, it was just terrible. And I watched. I watched. Um, I did watch the last one. What is it? Um, Rise of Skywalker. The Rise of Skywalker. It's though it should have been called Rise of Palpatine because she's not a Skywalker. Well, that's true. It's um. I I I don't know if this. I don't think this criticism is mine, but I would definitely agree with um, the criticism that said it's basically side quest. It's a video game side quest. The movie. <laughs> like it was just. It's it's really not good at all. Yeah. Oh, and I've seen. I I saw Solo and I saw. Rogue One. I've seen all the movies that they've made. Well, I forgot. I, actually, I, I, I forgot that I've seen Solo and Rogue One, and that also should tell you what my opinion of the movies was. I, there were things I liked in Rogue One. For example, the visuals were absolutely splendid, and the yep. cameo appearance of Darth Vader was just some of the best things I've seen in in Star Wars canon. I mean, really my, good. But I, I think the yeah, the main character couldn't hold the plot together. The decision to portray the rebellion as morally dubious as morally gray violates the the spirit and mood of the original it's rebels are supposed to be the good guys and the uh the story and the theme was was awkwardly done as if they as if in rogue one they were trying to merely silence fanboy criticisms of possible plot holes in the original trilogy <laughs> and if that's your if that's your point for making a movie then that's that's no point at all you know Solo is one of those movies that it might have been good if they had made sequels and made something of them, you know, like a crime drama. But as it was, it was it was kind of forgettable. I I, I barely yeah. remember seeing it. No, I I I watched Solo on a plane trip to the U.S. and it was I mean it was all right. It wasn't it was right. terrible, but yeah. kind of forgettable. But it, but it, actually, I would say sorry, Rogue One. I agree. I didn't. I actually like my favorite part of Rogue One is when they attack the Scarif base I think that is that is that whole sequence um with the whole battle for Scarif I think is my favorite um fight scene in all of like big pitched battle in all of Star Wars so it, it, it was well photographed and the uh the robot character whose name I forget the 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 rebel robot who had been reprogrammed to serve the rebellion he was a great character the <laughs> blind was. guy who used the force to fight with even though he wasn't a Jedi but he was he was sensitive uh what a great character. All these guys were good characters. The mm. uh, 
but the main character was a little forgettable because I don't yep. remember her at all, uh, except that she was the daughter of the engineer who built the Death Star, mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, the main guy hero. I don't quite remember anything about him. He doesn't. He doesn't. It's not like Luke Skywalker, Space Farm Boy, who is an archetypal character that comes straight from Joseph Campbell. Okay, he comes straight from yep. from Buck Rogers and, and Flash Gordon and every other every other science fiction space opera of all time. Okay, Han Solo, lovable yep. rogue, is is an eternal character. He's the maverick in the group. He's the he's the uh, he's the level he's the rogue, and then you have a princess, a spunky <laughs> princess at that, with lots of moxie who who shoots at, yep. ro at robot rebels, and uh, I mean. The original Star Wars was epic and archetypal and and uh, surprisingly well constructed. When I rewatched it recently, I noticed how cleverly the plot points are set up uh, are set up and followed through. And that's the basic trick of any writing. And for any writing, you have to show it's like a golf swing. You have to have mm -hmm. a you have to draw your club back and show the reader or the viewer what's about to happen. Then you contact the ball. You know you have the event happen, and then you show what yep. the result is. See. And, and Star Wars did that very cleverly with plenty of interesting plot twists. And I have to say, it, a good word crawl, you know? Even right at, at the, there's only the three paragraphs to introduce you to the world of Star Wars. By the end of those That's three paragraphs, true. everyone in the audience knows exactly where they are. They know what the galaxy is, they know what the evil empire is, and they know yep. there's a space princess trying to fight to save her people. And she's the only character mentioned in the word crawl. The other, the other characters, Luke and Han and the two the comedy relief robots, who turn out to be heroes, are introduced later. So yep. the thing builds up really nicely and really quickly. When That's Vader true. comes on stage, there's not even a line of dialogue. All you hear is his obscene phone call breathing, and you see his <laughs> skull mask and his Nazi helmet, and he's wearing a big black cape. So you know he's the villain. That There's guy, no yeah. question. Okay, <laughs> it's wonderful. It's, 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 it's adroit, and that's why it was so well received. Even though all the critics panned at the time. In, in the 1970s, only Bitterness and Cynicism, Easy Rider was a famous film of the time. Was yep. only, that, only things that criticized America were on, on screen. So here was this Fair. film that harkened back to the American film experience of the 1940s and, and early 50s of going into theater and seeing a Buck Rogers short that started mm -hmm. with a word crawl. I assure you, everyone in the audience knew what kind of film we were going into once we saw the word scroll up the screen uh, you know, a long, long time ago, far, far away. Uh, even though none of us were old enough to have actually seen that kind of thing. Well, maybe our parents were. Does that make sense? It, it, yeah, it, it does. It, it, it touched an American archetype, Star Wars, and, and that's why it was brilliant. And I, myself, I will get arguments with this, but I think Empire, Empire Strikes Back was better than the, even than the original. Because it, it got deep and it opinion. got dark, and it was written by the same writer who not only wrote uh, Jor-El of Jorah and uh, Northwest Smith stories, but she also wrote The Big Sleep. Unless I'm, unless I'm confusing it with, uh, with uh, Maltese Falcon. Okay. So. Oh, and I have, of the TV series, I watched The Mandalorian, which I enjoyed. I did too. I got two, episode, two or three episodes into Boba Fett and just sort of haven't gotten back to it, which is usually a sign I wasn't enjoying it yeah. or it wasn't gripping me. Um, didn't even try Obi-Wan, just heard so much stuff about it. But yeah. It's on the list of maybe I'll try an episode. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm the same I, well, way. I, 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 I watched Mandalorian and really enjoyed it. I actually you know, said, thank God that someone at Disney knows what they're doing. Because what they did with Mandalorian, if I, if I may, to do a good Star Wars film, what you need to do is get, your, get, your, uh, get the look and feel of a space opera, then add elements from samurai movies, and add elements from old westerns. Because that's what the original Star Wars was. You know, and then you, and then it'll work, and then it'll work, and you have to have a. And, and in this case, it was uh, uh, lone wolf and cub. In this case, you just have the the bounty hunter get a uh, a little baby, baby, and everyone who doesn't love Baby Yoda, everyone loves Baby Yoda. Okay, how can you not? <laughs> and he's got eerie psychic powers too. So I mean, come on, uh, yep. how can you how can you get a better duo than that? You know. Uh, oh, yep. And they even oh, had. Oh, and I tried. Yep. I mean, sorry, go. They. They even had an old Western kind of guy help the Mandalorian out. When he found out that he was working for the, the remnants of the Empire, and you saw the stormtroopers in their battered old armor, because, of course, yep. their, their bosses were gone, but they were still in business, that was spooky. That was impressive, see? Mm. And uh, 
the last episode uh, had a cameo appearance that I will not spoil, but I will say it is one of the best things I've seen on the small screen in my life. Is, yep. is is the fight scene where the where yep. the good guys are holed up on a base in a space station, and the evil robots are all coming awake to come to kill him, and someone lands an X wing on the on the flight deck and, and gets out and helps him out. No, nope, I would agree. I also actually there's two other series, Andor, the new um, one, which is based on the one of the protagonists from Rogue One. Um, watched the first episode, dozed off. Not a good sign. Has that? Even, uh, I'm watched, surprised. I didn't even heard, I had not even heard that came out yet. Uh, that's that's out. I've tried oh. it. I'm probably not going back. And I watched the first. There was um, Star Wars Visions, which was done with. Um, it's an animated one. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a b- bunch of Star Wars stories in an anime style. Watched a few of those. They're pretty good. I'd like to get back to it. It's on the list to get back to. Um, that was all right. That wasn't bad. So, yes, there we go. So I think I've seen bits and pieces of everything, but. Um, Oh, and yes, the Orville, of course. I love the Orville. The Orville is fun. <laughs> the Orville is, is, is very it, good. It, it, it's a bit hit and miss. It has some crappy episodes that are a bit dud, but, you know, overall... There were some sure things in the so. Orville that I really objected to and I just thought were, were filthy uh, and yep. stupid. Uh, but there were things that I just thought were brilliant and as brilliant as anything I ever saw in original Star Trek. Such as, for example, there's an episode where they visit a planet and the government is run entirely by swiping right or swiping left on their version of the internet as yes. to who should live or die and it was and i forget what it's called like oh, social media was the name of the episode the and one of the one of the crew one? gets yeah. accidentally arrested and is on trial by a mass jury yeah. only of people who are going to you know kill him or, or spare him based on their whim as they sit in front of their computers i thought it was one of the most telling social commentaries that i've seen since i saw similar things in original star trek which occasionally would mm-hmm. make telling social commentary that I that I actually liked. Yep. No, I, I know the episode you mean. But the one where um oh, what are the characters' names? The uh the, the the flight officer and the engineer get themselves in trouble. Um, yeah. Because they're they're goofing around making fun of a, a public statute that they don't know what it means and they yes. you know it's it's photographed by some random passerby. Yeah. And then they go viral and it's all downhill from there. No, yeah. that was I was a the episode has some pro- like I mean, if you think about the plot a bit hard, it has some problems. But yes, I it was a, it was a sure. Very interesting but it reminds commentary. me of there was an episode of original Star Trek where Frank Gorshin, the the Riddler from Batman, uh, 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 is a police commissioner from a planet where they're half black on one side and half white on the other side. Yep. Chasing another guy who has the same skin skin tones, uh, and the Enterprise accidentally inter- intercepts them and has to decide whether to let the officer continue or to interfere. And although I've heard many people mock that as being a heavy-handed episode, when I rewatched it, it did not seem heavy-handed to me at all, because the writer there showed the good and bad side of both their points of view. Okay. And the moment when when the when the racist says, "But he and his people are white on the right side. I and my people are white on the left side," it's I'm sorry, that's just a brilliant that's just a brilliant analogy. And they end up with their planet on fire. Uh, they end up destroying <laughs> themselves because of their race hatred. I, I, that does not seem that does not seem any more heavy-handed than any other Aesop's fable seems. Okay, so and if yep. you think about it, of course, you you might find some plot holes or plot flaws as to what the setup is, but that's true for a lot of films, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it was entertaining and it was done well. Likewise, the Orbals entertaining and done well. Now I have to say, they throw in a few politically correct ideas that I just think are terrible. Like the mm-hmm. the doctor annoys me because she's a single mom trying to raise two kids. And they're trying to make that, they're trying to make a shattered household seem like it's normal. And it's about as normal as having a broken leg. Maybe you can recover from it in time with a cast, but it's not something that you should enjoy or, you know, or, or, or seek out as a, uh, uh, isn't, you know, the fact that... Isn't her uh, husband dead? What's that? Like, didn't, didn't her husband die? Like, she's a widow, isn't she? I... Maybe I misunderstood the episode. I, I didn't think she was a widow. I thought she just had kids because she wanted to. Oh, okay. I could be wrong. Cause, like, I could also, I could also widow, be wrong. So. I don't want to badmouth the show. No, but I noticed fine. that the kids, in order to find a father figure, turned to the robot, which is, yep. which is really awkward and really, really unusual, but it was handled really nicely, uh, especially since the robot comes from a race of evil robots, though he himself is not, is not evil. Spoiler alert. 
Uh, yep. Uh, but there's also things that are just annoying, like having a planet whose biology is entirely homosexual, which just makes no sense. I mean, you, you could have them yep. be like, there's certain invertebrates that hermaphrodites were one... one member of a couple could be male or female depending on the season or, or the, on their hormones or something but mm -hmm. the idea that they're all men is just stupid and and the the point of it is merely to try to normalize something that should not be normal in our society or in any society for that matter it's, it's not yep. when we talked the last episode about truth truth means your emotions and your passions are supposed to line up with reality and you so that means your sexual passions should line up with the realities of sex which for a mammalian species means there's two sexes and to have sex you have to have sex with the other sex. That's that's the way it goes. Otherwise you're just you're doing a mockery of sex. You're doing you're just playing around. Mm. Well, I mean, yes. They I mean they can construct their aliens any way they want their aliens, I guess, but Yeah, but they did. Like, but they didn't construct their the aliens. Nose. That's the point. They didn't make them into a hermaphroditic species like Ursula K. Le Guin did in Left Hand of Darkness. They didn't make him into a species that had some way of reproducing that made sense. They just said they're all males. Well, if they're all once, if, if, it's, a, if it's an asexual species, like the Eodorians mm. from uh, Lensman series, then they're not male and female. If they can, if they're hermaphroditic, they could play either male or female roles depending on the season or their, their hormones or something. But if you're going to make it up, they, they later on introduced the females of the species. You know, in a later episode. Yeah, that's true. So, now, if you want to have it's all males and they reproduce by cloning or by some artificial means because the females were wiped out in a plague, that's fine. Uh, uh, Cordwainer Smith had a short story based on that premise. That's perfectly feasible, perfectly possible. But in a science fiction story, you can't here, ignore yeah. the science of biology. Let me put it that way. If you're going to make up an alien species, alien reproductive system, go ahead and make it up. But don't not make it up and just say, our biology is exactly like woke psychology. Uh, yes. That doesn't work. Oh, we forgot a Star Trek series. There's also Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which is a Christopher Pike on the Enterprise before Kirk series. Oh, which I haven't I got, seen it. I wasn't even aware of it. I got three it. episodes in. I got three episodes in and then heard it just went really woke and was already a bit iffy on it. So just sort of gave up. Too bad I always kind of liked Pike back in the original, uh, in the pilot. It started all right, but, you know, you can't trust the clowns at um, Secret Hideout. Or, or you it. can trust them and you can trust that they're out to get you to destroy <laughs> your, your beloved childhood dreams, your, your cultural icons and your religion, including your secular religion of the shared uh, legends and the shared myths you have in common with your fellow Americans. That includes things like Star Trek and Star Wars. I mean, those mm. things are those things are Homeric myths. They are cultural myths. It's just odd because they're up there on television rather than being recited mm -hmm. by a blind poet. But that's what they are. I have to say, um, when it comes to certainly the new Star Trek series like um, Discovery and Picard that I watched, do you, do you know what annoys me the most about them? Like, just really 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 aggravates me beyond anything else i hate to they say look, it but i don't think i know you well enough to venture a guess they look gorgeous like i mean <laughs> star trek discovery is um it's it's kind of grim and dark but it's but it's beautiful like the special effects in it are amazing i the, i was about i was about to ask you how can you tell what picard looks like because they turn the color they turn the brightness down to zero so it's all taking place in a inside of a coal well, cellar at night, as best I can tell. Well, no, but but this is but like but like the CG effects in yeah. Enterprise that I watched, um, like the outside shots of the ships and stuff, for Discovery. Sorry, they're they're the movie level quality. I, I've seen they're I've gorgeous. seen some of the shots. I yeah, feel the same the, way. I feel the same way about Rings of Power. The the background the details, the, the the set direction, the art direction, is just astonishing. But that's also a show I haven't writings... watched because I was warned it was too woke and it just looked t it just. You know, like She-Hulk is another show I've never going to watch, even though I'm a She-Hulk fan. I was yeah. back in the day, but these these but guys have yeah. these guys have movie level budgets and movie level special effects, gorgeous art direction, and the mm. writing is terrible. The writing is but worse it's, than incompetent. It's actually it's actually me. bad writing, meant to be bad, yeah. meant to offend, meant to be incoherent. 
as odd as that sounds, you would think they would try to make money, try to tell a story. But You'd think so. Go ahead. I was going to say, but it would actually irritate me less if they hadn't had the really high quality effects. I mean, yeah. if it looked like garbage and the writing was garbage, that'd be fine. But it just, it irritates me that it's like, this looks amazing and you can do this amazing stuff and this is what you do with it when so uh, many of the original series episodes could have benefited so much from this quality of I mean okay in um let me let me interrupt really... to say I felt sure. that way about Last Jedi there are parts of it where I turned it to the Spanish uh, dialogue so that I couldn't understand what they were saying for certain scenes just because I wanted to look at the scene and there's a, there's a scene where they they uh, uh, Admiral uh, Gender Studies Purple Hair smashes a starship in a kamikaze move through another starship and destroys yes. most of the fleet. It's one of the most gorgeous things I've ever seen on the screen. It's brilliant. It's well done. The the music and the background and a moment of horrible silence happens right when you right when you mm -hmm. uh, is needed to produce maximum effect. But it's also one of the stupidest scenes I've ever seen. <laughs> Because if they could do that in that universe, in that background, they would have done it to destroy the Death Star. And when Admiral Purple Hair Gender Studies died, I applauded because she was a hateful <laughs> character and I wanted her to die. Yeah. I'm only sorry she did not take longer to die and did it in a lingering fashion, you see. So these guys had a bucket load of money. These guys had a boatload yeah. of money. These guys had a mountain of money to spend on special effects. But they couldn't spend 25 cents on a lighter? <laughs> I would have done it for free! <laughs> well, but this is it. There was a scene in... And, um... and I am. My, my, it's called Star Quest. I'm writing it right now. It's going to be a 12-volume 12, 12 series of what, they, what, what would have happened if they'd hired me to write a sequel. Okay. Well, no, but this is what I was going to say. In, um, in the first couple of episodes of Discovery, there's a scene where Michael Burnham, the character, is trapped in... Uh, has been thrown in the brig... And the ship has been damaged, and that section of the brig has been open to space. And she's just she's sitting in the brig, and they've drawn the force field for the corner of the cell. And so it's like she's trapped in this cell um, because part of it's open to space. But you can see the outline of the cell um, where the force field's holding the atmosphere in for a. It just it looked really good, and it was a cool it was yeah. a cool shot. But but at, but um, in the first two episodes, um, this really struck uh, stuck with me as unbelievably irritating right at the start uh, Michelle Yeoh who does actually turn up later in the series oh okay um, well tell me character... which episodes maybe I'll watch just them and no others <laughs> um, they do a little arc in the mirror universe and it's actually that's actually really good right at the end but anyway so did um, so did Enterprise Enterprise yes, did an arc I love in the mirror episodes. universe which I actually liked I thought it was kind of cool yeah but sorry uh, let me let me finish my point I'll try Go to ahead, focus sorry. Um, <laughs> Right at the start, they encounter the Klingons, and the first officer, Michael Burnham, is there going, I know about the Klingons. We, we need to punch them, effectively, like, punch them in the mouth so they know we mean business, and that's what they expect. Um, which, you know, okay, that's fine. And Michelle, you know, the captain's going, no, we can't do that. That's not the Starfleet way. We'd, we'd never fire first. And it goes badly, but, like, okay, we've established Burnham is practical, and uh, the captain is wants to follow the rules for Star Trek and is honourable and, you know, like, right. it's Starfleet even if it kills me because that's the morally right way to do. And I'm fine right. with that. Both of those characters can be established that way. Right. It's one's, Except, by, the, one's by the book and the other's the Maverick. It's a, it's a, it's a typical, it's a typical uh, binary. Yes, but by the end of the episode... Um, they're discovering the Klingons are uh, beaming their, like a, using a tractor beam to pick their dead up. And the captain suggests in order to attack the Klingons and survive, they basically booby trap some of the bodies that they're picking up um, so that they'll explode when they're brought on the ship. Um, so they're basically booby trapping the dead, which, if I recall correctly, is a war crime. <laughs> yes, you recall and, correctly. Uh, and Michael Burnham is iffy about this, and it works in their escape. And but it's just like, no, this this character was willing to die for her principles. Her principles mattered to her more than her own life at the start. Right. But later in the episode, she's willing to commit a war crime to escape. Horrible. This can't be the same. This is not the same person. Like, 
who is writing these characters and do they know actual people? Because I'm the not sure is, they do. The answer is no and no. The, the, <laughs> the writing is pro, is bad because the the woke philosophy is basically a cultural Marxism, and cultural Marxism is based yeah. on Marxism, and Marxism is based on uh, uh, consequentialism, based on the theory that the ends justify the means. Now, as a writer, you have to show some tension between both the good guys and, if you're smart, the bad guys, between their lofty ideals and their practical considerations. That's why the binary between a by-the-book cop and a maverick cop is always so interesting, because both of them mm -hmm. are kind of in the right, and, and there's always a tension between them. Yep. Now, but in Marxist theory, and therefore in cultural Marxist theory, there's no such thing as higher morality, because morality doesn't come from God, it doesn't come from nature, it comes from the human will. We make it up. We make it up as we go. Yep. So, so they never have any conflict between ends and means. They never have any conflict between ideals and pragma pragmatism. They only have uh, sides. And anything my side, any war crime committed by my side is good, and if your side does the exact same thing, it's evil. That's because the standard used by the woke is the double standard. It's the only standard yep. they have. Rules for me and not for thee. Well, you can live your life as a hypocrite. It's, it's fine. It's a possible uh, social survival strategy, which works as long as you don't get caught. But in a writing, in a, in a story, you lose the drama of having your character have some integrity, which is always dramatic. Yep. because it's always put to the test see so the character mm -hmm. immediately becomes boring and then they become not a hero but merely what we call a designated hero he's a designated hero because the author happens to be telling the story from his point of view you yeah. know so booby trapping bodies I can't even think of something more disgusting well, uh, I mean, I mean uh, Kirk would never do that These, the, she should be court martialed I'm glad I didn't is, see that episode that's terrible Michael, Michael Burnham's character who wanted to attack the Klingons at first, I could have believed her suggesting it because it was the pragmatic solution right. so that they could escape and everybody survive. Like it right. was life or death. But to have the captain suggest it was just like, no, this, this person was not willing to fire first, even though it was the right course of action because of yeah. her principles. So that just rubbed me the wrong way That's so true. badly. That's but I, I gave the first season a go. It did get better. It did do an arc in the mirror universe, which was really quite good. And then right at the end of the season, it totally crapped its pants. Um, they'd sort of been establishing where they were going to go. And they had an opportunity to defeat the Klingons who were beating them in the war. And they balked at the last second. It was just, it just it rang really hollow and it irritated me. And then the second season started. I got a couple of episodes in and went, I just don't care. <laughs> Now, is it the is it the wokeness? Is it the writing? I think it's the writing. I mean, there's woke. It, well, let me rephrase that. I, I have a theory that the woke can't write good stories because old school liberals, people who uphold you know a traditional left wing values like Gene Roddenberry, could write perfectly cromulent stories, really good stories, stories that that moved me and affected me and affected my whole life. Okay. George Lucas is not a conservative, and he wrote Star Wars, no. which had a profound effect on my youth. Profound. But leftists took over liberalism. They, they yeah. hollowed it out from the inside and are wearing it like a skin suit, like, yeah. like something from Men in Black or, or Silence of the Lambs, if you, if you yeah. catch my reference. Uh, and they don't, have, they don't have the same values that, that liberals are. Liberals are in favor of the First Amendment. Leftists are not. They're against it. Liberals are in favor of Israel, the existence of Israel. Leftists or not, they want to destroy it, and so on and so forth. But they also, the difference is, liberals had some understanding and sympathy for the human, the human condition. Mm -hmm. I remember many, not one, but at least three or four of the original Star Trek episodes were about the fact that a, even an operating utopia, even a, a well-constructed utopia run by a computer, was mm -hmm. incorrect for human existence because we can't, we're not supposed to live that way. And they would have the Captain Kirk, uh, you know... Uh, say that he was from Crete and that all Cretans were liars and the computer would blow up and they'd, they'd save the Enterprise uh, with no moral quandaries about I, I can't say no moral quandaries they would point out that it, the things would get worse but they would also point out that there was a good side to that because the, the people would have to actually try to solve their own problems hereafter even if they had to deal with 
passions and and uh, and uh, violence and so on and so forth. Uh, so, I mean, uh, you may or may not agree with that moral insight, but it's it's but saying there's no utopia this side of heaven is is a brilliant thing to say. It's, yeah. It it can make an interesting story. But if your story is I can do anything because I'm a woman without training, and anything I do is good no matter what, and anything you do is bad no matter what, whether you agree with that philosophy or not, there's no story there, nor can you make a story out of it. Because the main because character, kind of... if, if the main character is, un, is unimpeachable and un, uh, undefeatable, the first time she picks up a lightsaber, she can defeat a trained Sith in hand-to-hand -hand combat, even though he's a man and stronger than her, and trained, and she's not, because she's female. Well, well, that's that's just no, there's no drama there because there's the, the the fight is foreordained, and you don't feel any you don't feel any sympathy for the character because she didn't have to struggle to overcome anything. Mm -hmm. you, you can't identify with her because you're not the chosen one who just happens to be perfect. You know, the only yes. the only drama in a woke story is the drama of getting the patriarchy to recognize how wonderful you are. I don't know if you saw the movie <laughs> uh, Captain Marvel, but that was basically yes. the theme of that movie. She did not have to struggle to overcome to do anything <laughs> except for her own internalized self-doubt. Once she unleashed the power of the sin of pride and became as great and potent as Lucifer, the archangel, then she was the heroine. And that, and that was it. Um... Oh, I did hear an interesting story. Supposedly, J.J. Um, Abrams wrote a plot uh, outline for what he wanted to do for episode... What's that? Two. Six, seven, eight, eight. Well, okay. Um, the, second, the second sequel movie. And apparently, in, the, in that, um, the reason Ray was omnicompetent um, with the Force and stuff, despite no training in episode six, seven was because Luke was assisting her at a distance. I was like, ah, oh, that would that, have made all of that make sense. That would have been <laughs> that fine. Would have, that, that would have made would it good, have, yeah. That would have been fine, but you can see why the woke would not permit that. If she oh, turned course. out to be the reincarnation of Vader, I would have found it fine. If she had turned out to be the, uh, the clone of Palpatine, that would have been fine, you know? I'm 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 satisfied that Palpatine's daughter should be strong in the Force, but even people who are very strong in the Force have to be trained. That's been established in yep. the canon, you see. Yes. So uh, the difference is there's a big difference between the way I judge a film if it's a standalone film of something the author has made up himself, like uh, uh, Jupiter Ascendant uh, is is a science fiction film that came out by the same guys who did the yep. uh, who did the uh, Matrix trilogy. Mm -hmm. Um. It was a standalone, and it had it had many many writing problems, <laughs> much much internal difficulty with writing. Uh, but it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't pulling down a monument. It wasn't spraying graffiti on something yeah. that had already been established. See, and here's why I call it spraying graffiti. Here's why I think it was a deliberate act of. I think the Last Jedi was a deliberate act of malice. I've seen some of that director's other films. I saw Brick. He's not he's not incompetent. It he can't have been Looper, a mistake. For, for, to, and to, I liked Looper. To decide. Oh, I liked Looper too. You know, hmm. uh, it can't have been a mistake. He knows how to write films. That means he must have tried to make a film in order to show that the Star Wars universe is bad and that everyone who likes it is, is, is wicked. It was written as an insult for, to me, you know. And also the part that in the, in the, in the early, in the, in the uh, word crawl, it says, Dear John Wright, I hate you, you know, signed. <laughs> and I was like, wow, really? I was, hmm. Now, I was the only one in the theater who saw those words, but I think they were still there. <laughs> so. Yes. But, oh, yeah, no, The Last Jedi was just... And then you've got the established big bad guy, and he kills him. They get killed trivially halfway through the... Um, yeah. Halfway through the movie. And, uh, yep. Yep. It was, it was just not... Yeah, it was just not a good film. It was a deliberately bad film made deliberately. I, I, I am not willing to... I've thought about it a lot, and I'm not willing to say that it was incompetence. It looks to me like it was an expression of woke philosophy, and woke philosophy says... Woke philosophy says if you ever there's a rule, the way to happiness is to break the rule, no matter what the rule is. That applies not just to moral rules. The way to happiness is, is to have sex outside of marriage, because that's what the rule is. The rule is you're supposed to have mm -hmm. sex in marriage. 
The way to happiness is to break that rule. The rule is that men should be men and women should be women. The path to happiness, according to the woke, is to break that rule. The rule is that the races should get along with each other. The path to happiness, according to the woke, is to break that rule and have the races have a riot. Okay, have the races hate each other and fight each other. That's everything yep. they do. The rule is that uh, that you use he for the pronoun if you don't know the sex of the antecedent. Okay? They woke yep. break that rule and say he, she, they, zer. They say you get to pick your own grammar rules. Yeah. You get to pick your own language. Okay. Well, the rule of storytelling is you have to have a character that people like. Okay, that means not Admiral Holdo, not Admiral Purple Hair. That means yeah. they have to face an obstacle they cannot overcome. So that means not Ray. Ray faces no obstacles she's not able to overcome. And the, and the character overcomes it because there's something driving him that he really likes. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a need, there's a, a destiny or a dream or a terror that they either have to face or seek or fight. And the audience wants that person to succeed. You're not rooting for... The Empire, okay, which yep. which Last Jedi did not do in in spades. Now another rule in for movie making is you have to have an action. If you have a chase scene, it can't go slowly for ninety minutes. A ninety minute slow yep. chase scene of starships running out of fuel is not fun. It's not exciting. Okay, yeah. Han Solo being chased through an asteroid field. By the Empire shooting at him with it's giant exciting. snakes around, that's exciting. That's the most exciting stuff I've ever seen on the screen. Okay? Mm. Especially when the comedy of the robot says he has no chance of, of living and he's going <laughs> to die. Okay? Well, never tell me yeah. the odds. Brilliant scene. Okay? Yes. The scene where the, the resistance is being chased by the First Order uh, through empty space slowly, and then the Grease Monkey and the the extra guy who's there for no reason, the ex-stormtrooper, go off on a side quest to go to a casino to release a bunch of space horses so they can trample yep. a bunch of innocent people <laughs> and, then, and then get rescued by a code breaker of... What? If, if they could unload and get onto the space casino, why couldn't everyone just go to the space casino? Why was it just them? Yeah. Why is he even? Why is he even aboard the ship? He's not a member of the resistance. And if he's a, and if he's an ex stormtrooper, why doesn't he know the passcodes or the, the the technology or the way to get in? Why doesn't he do something useful? Why do I have to go get a code breaker to break the code if he's if he's one of the guys who was used to be part of their system? Okay. Oh, I agree. And oh, I was always irritated by um. Everything goes awry and everything ends in disaster. But the reason everything ends in disaster is because Holdo wouldn't all... What is it? Poe runs off with his side quest that ends in disaster. No, no, no. Poe did not run off the side... No, 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 no. You're forgetting how stupid this was. Poe is in charge of the defense of the planet when they're coming to be obliterated. The princess, who's no longer a princess, now she's a general, orders him back in, in... in a way that if he had obeyed the order, it would have been destroyed the entire, destroyed everyone. He pretends his radio is off. He disobeys the order. He successfully drives off the Empire, and they escape successfully. Then he is blamed for disobeying orders. Okay? And demoted. Yep. And then she no, no, no. is, and then she yep. is killed by a random space jockey, not her son, who was thinking of killing her, and his, his black-clad evil finger was getting near the bomb button but he didn't do it at the last minute for no reason even though he was going to kill her a moment before for no reason and then she gets bombed into space for no reason and then she dies for no reason well no so she dies from explosive decompression but then she's not dead for no reason and has the power to fly back through space for no reason back into the the flight deck for no reason and they throw open the door to go embrace her in, in hard vacuum for no reason because that should have blown them all out of into space to, to an yeah. instant horrible death but, um... But, no, but Poe... But the, the scene that... One of the things that irritated me was Poe launches the side quest to the casino planet, which brings back the code breaker that... Oh, he know, launched it, the side quest. Into, I forgot that. You're right. I'm sorry. You're but, right. But, but the reason he did that is because Holdo wouldn't tell him the plan. And it was right. just like, shut up, do as you're told. Right. 
you know, you stupid, you stupid man, shut up, do as you're told. Right. And um, so Poe then goes and does something that causes trouble. And I think... Except he doesn't. The well, those two going away and coming back do not cause any problems for the, for the resistance. No, it does, because they bring the Codebreaker back who betrays them. Oh, yeah, okay, that, that, that does happen. The Codebreaker does betray but, them, correct. But, the, but, but it irritated me because the message I think the filmmaker's trying to convey is Poe did the wrong thing not listening to the smart woman and doing as he's told, but if she'd told him the plan, he would have gone, oh, okay, and done as he was supposed to do. Like, her not willing to confide in him and not willing to... Yes. reassure the troops and explain to them you're overthinking we have this. a handle you're, on you're this we know what we're it. doing that wasn't the moral of the scene you're overthinking this that was not the moral of the scene the moral of the scene is women are always right and men are toxic that was the moral but, of the scene it was just racism she, against the male species but I suppose no but, but I mean like a good leader the, the reason Poe ran off and caused the trouble he did was uh, but, because they didn't think she knew what she was doing, and she thought she was going to get them all. They thought they were. She was going to get them all killed because she was incompetent. But again, she had a plan. Again, I insist. And if she told them, because if a woman had disobeyed orders and gone shooting off by herself, like Ray does worked. in the same show, no, nothing bad happens when that happens. It's only because well, he was a. The point of that scene was to show the man was bad. Man, bad. The point was not to show disobedience is bad. Because when a female disobeys, it's rewarded. Oh no, I get, I get that. I okay. mean, it's just, I don't know. It's frustrating because, yeah, obviously their message is something like, well, if he just listened to the smart, wise woman, it would have been fine. Right. But it led to disaster because she didn't. But that's not the takeaway message. The takeaway message from the scene is, if she told him what was going on, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have been concerned that she didn't know what she was doing. I mean, yeah. The takeaway like, message was all—it was all, was was all right. her fault. Poe should have led a mutiny, which he did. Uh, he should have spaced her rather than leaving her alive, so that she could get back into command, which which he did not do. Well, I mean, that's but, that's that's the takeaway. The takeaway is that is that yeah. during a rebellion, you can't allow your your uh, CO to to lead you to disaster, especially since the plan was sneak off the ship. <laughs> Which, but I think, which Poe had already done successfully. But I think the plan would have worked, like, if they hadn't done the other things that caused the problem, but the other things that caused the problem were because she wouldn't tell him the plan. Like, oh, oh. Annoying. Yeah. No, I mean, these, these shows are all... Unfortunately, these shows are all terrible. Um, the writing is always terrible. I mean, and if, they had, if they had done something simple in Last Jedi, like... The reason why the, the First Order is tracking the Resistance through hyperspace is because uh, Snope is a Jedi and is using psychic powers to do it. <laughs> Otherwise, they would get away easily. So the only way to stop them is to get on board the ship and kill him. And then had a scene where Ray volunteers for a suicide mission to go do that. You know, I mean, never mind. It would be basically any change. If you changed the plot at random you would get a better story. If you had like a list of 10 possibilities for every scene and threw uh, dice to... Well, let's make it 12. So you can... Between 3 and 12. Uh, and threw dice to see to decide what would happen next. You'd end up with a better plot. It would be more coherent. It would make more sense. So, and that's that's why I never saw the, the final film. Because at that point, the storytelling was so bad that nothing the writer could have done, in my opinion, could salvage it. Although I think... Bringing Palpatine back from the dead was about as clever as you could do, given what, uh, given what the wreckage you'd what been left been with. Dumped in his lap? Given, given that the oh. main the main villain's dead, the heroes are all dead. Uh, there's the the resistance is out of out of resources, not fighting for anything, and all the main characters are either stupid or you want them to die. N none of the characters are appealing in any way. <laughs> okay. Yep. Uh, uh, what's the best you can do given that given that pile of dog's breakfast to, to write a sequel you know given the setup I myself think bringing a, a popular uh, villain back from the dead is about all you can do even though it makes I mean honestly it makes Darth Vader's sacrifice at the end of the of the uh, 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 Revenge of the Jedi 
into garbage. I mean, it, it, it undoes something that should not have been undone. You know? Yep. So, um, this raises the question, are these series dead, or do you think they can be fixed? I think they can be fixed, and the reason I think that is because I saw The Mandalorian, and when I saw that, all was forgiven. That guy was an impressive character. He suffered from a moral quandary between his desire to be a good bounty hunter and, ab and abide by the bounty hunter code and his sympathy for an alien a critter that didn't have any real relationship with him uh, and the spooky character of the fact that the thing was force sensitive and, and that the Jedi were also interested in its fate uh, that just became really cool, really nice and he was not an impervious perfect Mary Sue character the Jawas could defeat him. They threw him off his their sand crawler into the dirt. Okay, that was a great character. Yep. Okay, the the uh, the robot that's programmed to self destruct when it's cornered is a great character. The other Mandalorians are also great characters. The fact when he finally gets a jetpack, okay, brilliant, mm. brilliant scene, well well photographed, good fight scenes. Fight scenes that made sense where you understood what was going on and who was shooting at whom and how they were getting away and how they were prevailing. Okay? Now, yep. there was a tiny bit of wokeness in it, but not any more mm. than was in the original Star Trek, uh, Star Wars stories, you know, so it was just fine. Yep. Boba Fett I didn't see because I just heard too many bad things about it, even though from the clips I saw, it looked like the art direction, it looked like the special effects were absolutely top-notch. Yeah, so, that's yeah. So yes, that's, Star that's Star Wars can be saved merely by saying, uh, "Time travelers erased the Disney the Disney sequels; they never happened." You know, can Star Trek be fixed at this point? Do you think, or do you think that's yes? Star shark? Trek can be easily fixed. You go into Good. the Mirror Mirror universe and you start by telling the story of how how the Empire falls and uh, the new the new Federation has to put itself together given its horrible past. Now, let me tell you, there was one Star Trek uh, series that you and I didn't discuss. It's called Star Trek Continued. It's entirely oh, yeah. fan-made. It's got the Alexander Courage original music. It's got special effects and sets that look like they came straight out of Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. The acting mm -hmm. is pretty good. It's not great, but it's pretty good. But the plots, the scripts, look like they were written by uh, you know, all the same original Alfred Bester and... and uh, 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 I mean, all the original, all the original writers. You know, Harlan Ellison. They're like they're like Harlan Ellison scripts. They're they're really good. So if you haven't seen Star Trek Continues, look it up on the internet. You can watch it for free because it's all fan made. It's all done out of yep. love of the original story, not like the Last Jedi, out of hate for the original story. You know. Okay. So yes, so... it could be saved if the people at start uh, uh, the people running it go. Uh, have an inquisition and burn the heretics who <laughs> blasphemed our beloved cultural yep. myths uh, and uh, and then start over again and then you say oh uh, that didn't happen you know <laughs> yeah, uh, okay um, just, just have enough. a time traveler change things or just well, ignore it just pretend just, just, just pretend it never happened the Mandalorian never deals with any of the events in uh, in, in <clears throat> In Forces Rising. That's Doesn't true. Need to. I think it's set before it, though. And go back to the original series of all the novels and comic books that Lucas himself had a hand in okaying. Go do a oh, Thrawn trilogy, okay? Yes. Go do something good. There's a lot of good stuff that was made for Star Wars that was never on the big screen that could be made for the little screen. And don't give me garbage no. like... Like, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi has to go save the little girl while leaving the little boy alone, and he fights Darth Vader, even though it's established canonically in Star Wars that that never happened, that he never met the guy again. And then they don't kill each other because they're trying not to? Well, they have to not kill each other or the third, the episode yes. can't happen I mean, here's, here's what I would have done if it had been me as the yeah. writer I would have had them be fight lightsaber fighting and getting near being one of them down on the ground Vader's down on the ground with his mask broken off and he's about to die and then Doctor Who appears in a <laughs> TARDIS and says wait 
you'll mess up the timeline because Star Wars already has been established and you can't change you can't change that. It's a fiction. And I would have to be a male Doctor Who because a female Doctor Who turned out to be garbage. Okay, they didn't have Michael Yo be the be the uh, Michelle Yo be the uh, male Doctor Who. So it was terrible. Okay. <laughs> uh no, that's true. I guess I guess that's part of the problem. They're trying to um they've they've got this existing franchise and they're trying to make more movies in it, but they keep trying to make them to fit in between places like Rogue One or Solo or um, these sorts of things, and they've they're they're sort of hemmed in by you know something has to happen down the track. I so... have no I have no sympathy for that zero. Let me tell you why. If I was a Greek playwright themselves. and someone said someone handed me a bag of dinars and said write a play about Prometheus, I would be hemmed in by the established lore. Prometheus has to lose the fight. He gets tied up on a mountain. A vulture comes and eats his liver. That's the story. Okay. Mm-hmm. If I'm writing, if, and I've written sequels, I, I wrote a Jack Vance story once for a Jack Vance collection. I was bound by Jack Vance's lore, and I did not violate it. I I, I was really careful. I wrote a sequel to uh, uh, the Null A books by uh, A.E. Van Vaught. Okay, I wrote mm-hmm. Null A Continuum as a sequel to World of Null A. I did not violate any of the canon, even though I was hemmed in by what he had established. I was honored to be honored to be asked to do that, to, to play in that background. And I loved those books. I didn't hate them. So sticking something in between, if you ask me to write a story that takes place between episode two and episode three of the prequel, I could not do as well as Glendy Tatavsky did, but he did a brilliant job. So please don't tell me. That's not an excuse. The fact that you are bound by what is established in your lore is not an excuse any more than an excuse to say uh, the publishers will not take a, a book that's over 600 pages. Or whatever it is. The magazine will not write stories that have a vampire in it. Okay, if you want to sell oh. that magazine, then you don't write a vampire story. No, I'm sorry. So, no, I no, no, I... no pity for me for that. Because what's really going Fair on enough. is not that they're trying to fit things into the canon. At least the guy who did Last Jedi is trying to destroy the canon. The people who did oh, Star Trek Picard are trying to undo the optimism of Star Trek. They're That's trying true. to do anti-Star Trek. Not. Oh, I agree. Okay. So that's not no, no, their I, problem. Their problem I is that they that they think they can make money. Maybe, excuse me. They don't care about making money. They think they can. They think their mission to the idol of untruth that they serve. They think that their mission in life is to denigrate and to destroy beloved cultural icons because they are beloved cultural icons, and that's their motive. Yeah, I'd agree. No, I'd agree with you. But I mean, what I meant was, um, you can't. Like in Obi-Wan, um, I guess it was dumb to have Obi-Wan and Darth Vader have a fight. You know that you yep. know one can't kill the other. You know neither right. character neither character can be in danger because and, you know they have to have a fight later on. And you and know they have to lead to that point. And, and you know that they met later. I mean I could still yeah. do it. I could still have them have a fight, and then when the mask comes off, you see it's a robot. And the real Darth Vader escaped long ago and is not even in the room. You know, I could steal that idea from Fantastic Four that happened to them with uh, Doctor Doom more than once, and then you could actually have an exciting fight, and you realize, oh no, it didn't. It, you know, it didn't happen. He got away. See, and then you have Vader over the radio say, "We will meet again. You can't hide." <laughs> you know. Well, that's true, actually. I mean, um... and have and have Obi Wan say, "On that day, I will I will face you, even if it even if I must die." You know. No, that's true. I suppose um, I enjoyed the new Top Gun movie, and I've watched. So did I. I've watched the last half of it through several times. <laughs> I know how it ends. I I know, I know they de- I know they survive. I know they get away. I know the bad guys are defeated. Spoilers! Spoilers! Some people haven't seen this movie yet. Fine, but I mean, like I know exactly how it's going to go, but it's still watch. I still it's still watchably riveting and like. I'm still on the edge of my seat going, are they going to make it? Even though, you know, I know they do. <laughs> Look, if I'm an ancient Greek and watching the play, I really am rooting for Prometheus, even though I know how it's going to end. Yeah. Oh, I saw that movie. I saw Top Gun Maverick uh, on your suggestion, on your recommendation. Oh, okay. And I thought it was brilliant. It's some of the best Good writing. Thing. Let me tell you why. <laughs> because I appreciate if you are bound, if you are restricted by the lore you've established in the first movie, they had to tell... It's hard to write sequels. It is not easy. You have to ha- hit all the same points, 
but not in the same order and get the same mood and theme with different events, but it's got to remind the readers of the previous events and grow out of them. So having the Maverick pilot show up at the Top Gun flight school, and then, of course, this time he's the instructor and he's got to pass along his lore to the, to the younger generation, that was mm -hmm. brilliant. It was very well done. It's very easy to make a sequel that is either too imitative of the original, Force Awakens was, was just such a failure, or mm -hmm. one that uh, violates all the canons of the original. It's just it's actually a different movie. I'm, I've picked on Last Jedi, but I also pick on the second Highlander movie. The second Highlander <laughs> movie had nothing yeah. to do with the first Highlander movie, okay? It was a piece of <laughs> garbage. The only, the only good thing in it was Sean Connery, because he's brilliant. In, in, he was good in Zardoz, okay? <laughs> and he was good in anything he appears in. Sean Isn't Connery. there only one Highlander movie? They made one Highlander movie and never did anything else with the product, as far as I know. Ah, uh, the TV show was actually pretty good. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so give it a chance. Give it a chance. Uh, no, fair now, enough. the problem with Highlander is a slightly different problem, is you can't really go anywhere with that premise, because you can't actually solve the, the problem of why are the immortals fighting. You can't have the prize come on stage. When the mm. Highlander won the prize at the end of the first movie, they had to just undo that. They just had to just pretend that didn't happen and set the TV series before the events of the movie. See? So yep. they once again were bound by their by their lore. But the show is passable. But I have to say, one reason why I'm such a big fan of Star Wars is in terms of sequels, one of the best sequels I've ever seen is Empire Strikes Back. It took all the original setup, all the original lore, uh, uh, and, and made it deeper and made it like a Greek tragedy almost when you find out, you know, who, uh, who Luke Skywalker's father really is. Uh, and the only other sequel I can think of that's even that's comparable as to how good it was compared to the original is the Terminator 2 sequel. I thought it was, better, I thought it was actually better than Terminator 1 where the shape-changing robot is, is the bad guy and the Terminator, the bad guy from the first movie, reprogrammed is the good guy and is, is trying to save the... Uh, to save uh, the the child, whose name is Mr. McGuffin, McGuffin Boy. They're different. Uh, they're, they're, they're pretty different films. I I mean, I like the first Terminator. They, they hit like, a lot of the I'm, same beats, though. They're both good yeah, films. That's true. They're both good films. Oh, yeah, no, they're, both, they're both great films, but they're very um. But they're very different. no sequels are ever made after movies. the second one, because the rest of them are just cabbage. Okay, they're just garbage. They're just terrible. The second uh, Star Trek movie, the one with the Wrath of Khan, I thought that mm -hmm. was one of the best sequels I've ever seen both to a TV show or to a movie, because uh, it actually had a kind of a deep theme. It was kind of a farewell to Star Trek, because Captain Kirk is getting old. He's an admiral now. He wears glasses, mm -hmm. and he, his, his, his vision can't be corrected by the medicine of the time. And there's a death, you know. Now, they made more films, and they undid the death, so that kind of undermined the, the impact. But that film, taken in isolation as a sequel as a sequel to a, a, one of the TV episodes where, where Khan is stranded on a, on his own planet because he's a superhuman, uh, was really well done. It was just brilliantly done, you know? Uh, so yep. people can do good sequels. Disney used to be able to be the best. They were the best storytellers in America. They told stories like Pinocchio, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, Beauty and the Beast. Those films were some of the best films I've ever seen. Just animated or, or live action, okay? They speak to the heart. They speak to the fundamental truth of human nature. Star uh, Star Wars was a fun film, but it also had something kind of deep in it, especially in the second and third film. The, the, the third film turns out to be almost a Christian allegory for redemption, okay? Where, where basically Vader and his, and his child are fighting in front of the devil. Okay, I'm sorry. Emperor Palpatine is one of the is one of the uh, most brilliant uh, uh, villains of all time. Uh, and yep. for the star for Star Trek to go woke and for Star Wars to go woke is just a crime against humanity. I agree. I and on to, that note... On that note, uh, my phone is ringing, so I think I have to go. Yes, we should wrap the episode up there. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk again in a week. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.